Thank you very much for having me. Um, thanks for, for uh, organizing all this, despite the fact that I can't take this side of the Okay, so uh, I need a lot of power control uh, till uh, my PhD, and then maybe I haven't been as active, even though I've been somewhat monitoring what's going, been going on and trying to reconsider what I've been doing myself, so I'll, I'll try to pick up some of those things. Uh, so I'm, I'm with Linspin University, uh, a small university, uh, or a smaller university in Sweden at least, uh, 20,000 students, so quite far from the size of Rutgers, and uh, Linspin is roughly two hours south of Stockholm, uh, and uh, it's the red dots. The green dots are four capitals in Scandinavia uh, and the Nordic countries. Uh, can you pick them up? Helsinki, Stockholm, Oslo, and Copenhagen, so it's like short distances to everything. Uh, and uh, in Linshipping, since 95, uh, Ericsson has in, uh, focused the, the GSM development and to a greater and greater extent, and since, and since last year, they now Linspin is now fully responsible for the GSM Ready Access Network, uh, and uh, since 1996, they also have a research branch there, and that's the reason why I started with Power Control, because we, they wanted some, some, some sort of, of cooperation and control sounded like, Power Control sounded like control, so that's why we started with this. Um, well, the group does a lot of things outside communications, really. It's, it's mainly focused on signal processing and system identification. Professor Young is, is uh, the leader of the group, and, and uh, we do a lot of system security activities and, and uh, applications as well, but not necessarily communication. It's trains and cars and, and all kinds of, of things. Uh, anyway, I'm also with Ericsson, as I said, but I, I'll try to bring up my most academic stuff. Uh, I'll wrap up with some, some field trial things uh, that I have been uh, uh, doing the last, or involved in the last uh, years, which has been quite interesting. Uh, so, what I, I intend to, 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 to center things around is to firstly focus on, on the link type of, of ideas and then move to the more system perspective. Uh, and uh, not necessarily are they different, but at least they are treated differently in literature. And uh, these are my biased interpretation of what things that has been going on. Uh, and, and the way, at least from, from the link perspective, uh, but, but uh, even at the system perspective, it, it's very educational to, to have this sort of simplified channel model. Uh, I mean, we, we really neglect, neglected the symbol le level effects and taps and all that. But, I mean, we, we say, that, okay, if we transmit with the power P, we will receive P plus G in, in decibels at the receiver. And uh, we can separate the power gain in three components. One which essentially depends on distance, which is the dash curve. Uh, one a correlated shadow fading and one uh, a faster fading. Uh, and this kind of disturbance, the, the looking at the fastest uh, disturbance of those three, uh, have some sort of frequency content. And, and a good representation of that is to see what kind of spatial uh, frequency content it has because we're really traveling through this type of variations in time. So if you travel faster, you will experience the variations faster. So, so uh, looking at the spatial uh, frequency content of, of uh, a vehicle A channel, which is which that is, we see that we get some sort of uh, knee up here. Uh, and uh, I should say also that this is actually combined effects of, of several rays. So it's sort of modeling a rate receiver, if you wish. So, so it's not, this is not really pure rate fading, then the, the, the fade would be much deeper. Uh, and we see that the, the bandwidth of the, of the disturbance is roughly 80 times the velocity in hertz. Uh, 
the collation uh, of, of uh, the shadow cadence of the model that's not an uh, armor process with uh, a few parameters, but roughly some sort of uh, oscillating uh, type of process. Okay, so some just to bring up some notation, I, I guess you all uh, are familiar with this, but uh, anyway, just to, to make it consistent. Uh, the power P, the power gain G, the interference I, and the resulting silver I, uh, and uh, would, would, would be like this. Here's something else shows up, and that's something I, I refer to as the receiver efficiency that you've written on the far below. I wonder, can you see all the way down here? Okay, I'll I, I hope I, I don't have too much information. Yeah, below that you only need to see once and then you know what what so you're promoting good posture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, which it was an idea that, that came up from, from one of, of Philip Godlewski's students that you could see the receiver as, as either it picks up to energy it's intended to it or or uh, the the remainder would be experienced as interference. So so you only can utilize a fraction of the, the power that's actually received. And some sort of relation between SIR and, and, and uh, the rate. Well, I mean, that, that's of course more more complex model or, and, and the truth is far far from that, but at least we have some sort of relation between the data rate and the C of I that you, you experience. Uh, so typically, you have two fundamental objectives here with, with uh, a wireless link. Either you aim at uh, a constant data rate, uh, which you typically do in, in the first round of the 3D systems. You have dedicated links where you want to keep a constant data rate. Or you can be more effective to try to maximize the throughput of this link by selecting when you transmit and by, by selecting the power to you, you uh, maximize throughput and efficiency. Uh, and that of course re requires more feedback and, and more complex receivers, transmitters and all that. So, so that's just mentioned here. We will focus on links where you try to keep a constant data rate, or even more simplified, to keep a constant CIR. So, go ahead. I just wondering, what's the delta T in terms of the um Delta T? Yeah. That's just the value between zero and one, saying that, okay, even though we receive this amount of energy intended to us, we cannot utilize all of it. So we might only utilize 90% of it or something. So, uh, at this stage, it's just a the dummy thing showing up because just <coughs> it doesn't carry any dynamic things or anything. Yeah. So what kind of power constraint you consider? Do you have a constant average power budget or you have a maximum ceiling for the power? At this stage I don't care about what kind of limitations I have. Uh, but I, I will bring up those limitations uh, meanwhile, even though I tend to, to, to put them aside just to, to simplify things. But uh, you're right, of course, we need to sort of uh, discussion around what kind of power you have available. Uh, okay, so what I would try to do here is just to bring in the control interpretation of things. And uh, one of the first, uh, or I shouldn't say first, but one of the early uh, power control algorithms, which is essentially when, when people say power control, they, they often bring up this. Uh, was it Grandi when he was a student here, was he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Sander, Yates, Grandi, well, you guys in the early 90s uh, brought this up just to show that this is has really good uh, properties convergence and all that. Uh, so if we just move to the logarithm scale, we get something that looks more familiar to a control control guy. We get a block diagram of like this uh, where the Q shows up. You know time shift operator in, time, in the time domain. It's like the C transforms, just that it's in the time domain. Uh, so we see that we can, we get sort of a feedback system here. Uh, and uh, yeah, nothing fancy, just a good start to say that, okay, you can see that the distributed power control is just feedback control. So let's start to see what kind of limits do you get here. Uh, and first I should apologize because all of a sudden all these eyes shows up. Uh, but I, I didn't have, uh, take the time to change those. But they weren't on the, on the first on the first picture. But anyway, I think you get the picture. Okay, so we have a general controller R uh, doing something with the signal. We don't know yet. But uh, 
what kind of limits do we have? Well, firstly, we have a limited uptake rate. In the WCMA, it's 1500 hertz for both the uplink and downlink. And in, uh, in uh, CMA 2000, it's 800 hertz in the forward link. Uh, so, that of course puts its limitations, and we'll come back to those. Uh, then, even though we, we, we try to be as fast as possible when we, when we measure and when we signal things, we will have time delays in the systems due to processing, due to uh, propagation delays, and so on and so forth. And the typical figure in WCMA is, is, is one slot extra. So, if you measure, send out the information, you will not update the power with the most recent information, the next slot, but the slot after that. You will have some measurement errors. You will never succeed in measuring SIR perfectly. Uh, here I have to say that you can use an additive disturbance, and I, I will not look too carefully into that. But uh, but with the, at least with the rate receiver as, as it is now, you will also get some some bias effect. But here I only add a, a zero additive disturbance. Uh, and here is the power saturation. And in fact, this is the only slide where it's mentioned. Uh, but we have that as well. We also have a limited feedback bandwidth uh, because we can't really rely on a, a perfect feedback channel. So we have to live with the feedback bandwidth. And the feedback bandwidth in <coughs> WCDMA is 1500 bits per second, which means that with update rate of 1500 hertz, you can, for example, have one bit each uh, update, or as, as it's also in the standard, you can have just three bits together. For, for to, to code uh, the command, and uh, then you get one third of the access rate, 500 hertz. Do you consider perfect feedback, or you allow for feedback errors? Uh, okay. <coughs> uh, in fact, this is the only slide where I'm, I mentioned feedback. Well, there's another slide as well. Uh, it should be considered, but uh, it's not uh, really put into the context more, more than here, saying that it's, it's a disturbance on, on the communication link. Okay, so, so I'll bring up two specific cases here. Uh, and essentially it's two assumptions about the feedback bandwidth. Either we say that, okay, we can feedback full information about what's going on to, to the transmitter. And that's essentially what we had in, in the the first case here, yeah, this distributed power control algorithm, you, you assume that you can measure SAR and, and essentially send it up to, to the transcript. Uh, and uh, instead of uh, as, as we had in, in, uh, in the DPC algorithm, we had a, a beta here, and, and that, that will come up natural when we look at time delays further on. So, with the same notation as before, we get the control block like that, and since we assume that we have full information about the situation, the error, the difference between these two, is just fed back to the transmitter to use for, for computation. On the other hand, we only can use one bit each update to, to go uh, code the control error. So one example is to use the sign in every instant, there are of course other alternatives, but the this is what is used in, in both CDMA 2000 and WCDMA. I switched the parameter to beta. I mean, they could have might as well use beta, but the other is what's typically used in, in standard computers. So uh, the quantizer is just a single bit quantizer. Well, since we have delays, and we know that there are problems with delays, one, one typical thing to do with delays is to do something called the Smith predictor which is essentially is useful when you know the system, you know the dynamics very well, and you know the delay. And as we have seen here, we know the, the system, because the system is essentially only ourself. It's just the controller. So, so in, we know that. And uh, at least if we believe that the delay is constant, independent of what kind of traffic situations we have, then we know the delay as well. So. Essentially, what we do is we modify the measured SIR to reflect the last uh, to reflect the last power used, 
And I, I'm, just, I'm not mentioning this to say that this is the most beautiful invention. I'm just mentioning that this is something you do to time delays because I will bring it up in simulations to show that uh, time delays can be handled. Uh, and same thing, it's not, not anything different between those two cases. And here I assume that I know the power, but you can be more specific and then uh, play around with this to see that you don't really need to know the power in, in the decision feedback case, but you can uh, play around with that, uh, but yeah, we'll do that for now. Okay, so the block we have will look like this. A linear block if we don't, if we have full information feedback uh, with the disturbance system and the delays and so on and so forth. Uh, Typical for a control guy to put together these two equations, saying that uh, what you would like to have, as I R, is equal to something related to no, what you have is something related to what you really would like to have, and the controller would would most desirably be zero, of course. But then you have two things shown up here: the G, which is referred to as the closed loop system and the S, the sensitivity function. And it turns out that S plus G is equal to 1 from the block diagram. Uh, and looking at, at this, and let's say that we take out the noise. We don't care about noise. We have a noiseless system. system. Well, ideally, I said G plus S is, is 1. Well, G equal to 1 and S equal to 0 would be perfect because then that's equal to to gamma target, this vanishes, and this vanishes at zero. Perfect. That would be perfect. Well, okay, with noise it wouldn't be perfect because we would be maxima maximally sensitive to noise. Not a good thing. Uh, so we couldn't, I mean, we, even if you could, we wouldn't like to do that. Uh, okay, I didn't write up the, the general expressions for G and S in this case. I, I, I do it when we have this integrated as a controller, then they are like this. And uh, just one comment here, when we have the delays, uh, the data can be used to make sure that we have a, a stable local system, that this loop is stable. And for example, if we have n equal to 1, we get an equation here and we see that beta equal to 1 won't work because then we will have a pole on the unit circle and that's the, the limit for, for instability. So we have to have a beta less than 1 here just to remain stable. Excuse me, are you something else? Uh, I think it was worth it, yeah. How, how is this model capturing uh, variations in the channel? Um, it does, but uh, currently, we only focus on, on the dynamics of the loop itself, but the variations in the channels are here, and since S is not equal to zero, they will affect the outcome of the controller. I mean, we will not perfectly manage to fit equality here because S is not equal to zero. So if you get a real channel, you would have to do some mapping to those GIIs to come back like a, some, some sort of a James model. You would do some mapping to GIIs. Yeah, this is just the time table. So we have the time variation. Uh, so, so, okay. so uh, I mean, if you're successful in your controller and if you would have the ideal case of this equal to zero, uh, then you, would, you wouldn't have to see any effects of the disorder. You would perfectly match the channel. Uh, Actually, my question is uh, very related to what just Dragon asked. So, this variability of channels, do you assume it's predictable variability or it's a random channel? It doesn't matter. It's just a disturbance. I mean, it's something coming out from here. But if it's, uh, let's say, a random channel prediction, I think you cannot, con you're doing a control which is uh, essentially a forward looking operation. So, you set your power uh, value call let's say the next slot or one slot from now and if the channel uh, inadvertently changes over that period of slot no matter how you control it there is randomness of a channel so you cannot uh, invert, uh, invert the channel uh, completely. No, uh, I will come to that uh, later on but uh, 
At first, we were just only really capturing the dynamics here, uh -huh. but we can we can notice two things. I mean, we cannot do this perfectly already in theory, even if we have had a, a very friendly and nice and slowly varying channel. We would not perfectly, uh, we I mean, given the noise and, and the channel, we still have some variations to try to. To uh, I'm not compensate. Sure, I'm not sure I expressed myself correctly. So your control is a discrete control. Right. It means you run it, let's say, 1500 times per second. So it means that the levels are being fixed <coughs> for uh, some period of a fraction of a millisecond. So if the channel is really changing fast, no matter how good you set these levels and you have a delay of, let's say, one, uh, one slot, no matter what you do, there will be variability. Uh, from whatever you said and whatever the channel really is. Just right. because it's random. On the other hand, of course, if you consider the channel to be predictable, then I would absolutely agree you can perfectly, in the noiseless case, you can control it. Absolutely. Well, uh, it, it doesn't matter if it's predictable or not. It, 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 it relates to the frequency content of, of the channel, how, what you can do. And, but I will come back to that. And it, it really relates to how these uh, parts behave. The closed loop system and the sensitivity function. The sensitivity function really directly says how much of the channel variations will appear in the error. And I would like the error to be zero. So I would like the S to suppress all the frequencies where where D is highly varying, so to speak. Uh, so uh, one thing we would really would like to, to make sure is that we have a stable system to start with, because we are, if you're unstable, we, we get in bad shape to start with. Uh, but as soon as we select a good beta, so beta equals to 0 0.3, that's well below 1. So, so that's something we'll use in, simulators, in simulations later on. Uh, just one comment. This is uh, two equations describing uh, uh, integrals put up by Bode in the 60s. 50s. Uh, saying that, well, you can't make this zero, not everywhere. You can make it zero at some places, but you cannot make it zero everywhere. Because when it's zero, or at least very low, the log of, of the value will be very, very low. And to make this integral sum up to zero, you have to compensate the very low value with a very high value at some other frequency band. So. If you if you perfectly cancel some sort of frequencies in the channel, you have to be prepared that other frequencies could kick you in in the back. <coughs> okay, so this really much uh, relates to your question. Uh, the uptake rate and the time delays uh, very much relate to the ability of the controller or any controller to track the power gain. So I have two types of, of channel variations, or two velocities really, because that really determines how fast my, my channel will vary. Two meters per second and nine meters per second. And uh, with that idea that uh, we have a frequency content up to 80 times V, we have 160 and 720 hertz of frequency content here. And just to see what I can see how this uh, integrating controller works. So you have beta equal to one and no delay, then, then this is just a DPC algorithm and, and that will, would work fine. Uh, we see that I'm good at cancelling or mitigating the time of variations when I move slowly. But when I move at well, moderate speed, then I have a hard time tracking this well. I get a lot of variations. So why is that? Well, if we look at the sensitivity function for this case, this is that one we see that the frequency 160 hertz up to this here. Well, the sensitivity is fairly low. We are good at suppressing those frequencies. But when the variations are faster, we really are not good at suppressing those frequencies. We have a quite high sensitivity. We are quite sensitive to those high frequencies. So we cannot suppress those. I mean, as you said, no matter how good we are, we cannot suppress those. And of course, this directly scales in, in, in the update rate. I mean, a faster update rate, we would have been better at, at this, of course. What was your step? Was it just 1 dB up and down? This is, no, this is not no steps well, at all. This is continuous. continuous. Yeah. Just only 
1500 updates per second, but each update is, has the infinite number of bits yeah. of occurrence. It's full information, so, so um, yeah, no, no bits. <coughs> what would happen if, let's say, you limit yourself to only one bit of update information, which means one dB up and down? Next slide. Yeah, that's a good question. And, mm -hmm. uh, but, but we'll say with one more thing first. Uh, so let's introduce the layer, and as I said, we have to do something about it so that we really will remain stable. And uh, bit equal to 0 0.34 actually is, is optimal in a sense, but uh, bit equal to 0 0.3. Uh, we get this kind of sensitivity. So we notice one, notice one thing here. We get a much smaller area where we're good at, uh, at attenuating the, uh, the disturbances. Much smaller area. So the delay. Okay, we can handle it, we can prove convergence, but we will be worse at attenuating the disturbance. And that is because we can only attenuate frequencies up to, well, 100 or something, very well. But as we see here, we are quite good at frequencies for, for that mobile as well. I mean, at least at the the major part here is at least below, but uh, I wouldn't even think of how, how that thing would look in, in that case. I mean, it would be much worse. worse. Uh, as I said also, the, this Smith predictor is a way of handling the time delay. And uh, in this case where we have full information, well, it's a, it's a nice setup and it looks nice in, in, uh, in theory, but after all, you can do this, roughly the same thing with linear design. Smith predictor is something fancy that just saves the planet. It's, it's something that does a good job in some cases when you know a lot, but you can do roughly the same with the same information with linear design. As we see here, this is a dashed curve for when you have the Smith predictor, and roughly you're almost equivalently good at, at suppressing the disorder. I think it might take, if you look at the lower right, the computer might think it's 3 a.m. Or, okay. or, or 4 a.m. Like it's doing light or it's fire. Ah, okay. Like it runs it in the middle of the night, but it comes in the middle of the night. Okay, so now I'll return to, to the case where, where you have a decision feedback. You only allow uh, one bit of feedback. Uh, and then, in this case, we, would no we notice this kind of variations in the power. Uh, the blue curve is really the envelope of the power in, in a certain situation and uh, the red curve is just low pass filtered so you see that this is really a variation around the slowly varying uh, mean and this is really so to speak what is trying to mitigate the fading and these things are just variations around that I mean these aren't there for the fading these are there because of the dynamics of, of, the, of the control loop this is due to the fading, as good as you can do it. Uh, and you can use uh, describing functions, whatever, something to, to analyze what kind of period you get here. And as if, you, if we uh, count carefully, we see that we have six steps in one period here, which fits with, uh, with uh, the situation here when we have a delay of, of one sample. So we have an oscillation period of six samples. Uh, so doing the same thing with the sensitivity function uh, and now since we're not linear anymore I, I did this just uh, uh, empirically just estimated the, the sensitivity from, from uh, measured signals in, in the simulations so we notice two things there is uh, an area, a region far down here where we're quite good at damping uh, the frequency content. But there are also two peaks marking uh, a resonant peak where, where you really introduce more frequency content. You, you, you sort of create more oscillations than you had before. Uh, and when you don't compensate for delays, you have it at a fairly low frequency, and when you do, you have it at a higher frequency. And that's natural. When you have a low frequency, then you have time to do the longer period oscillations and we have high frequency you only do like this right uh, and we can see here the gray curve is, is where you 
don't compensate for time delays and the blue curve is when you do. So you, you get a slightly smaller variance. Uh, it's not dramatically better, but uh, it's better. Uh, but you still have the oscillations and you have to live with those. So the oscillations are there because of... of, of uh, so there's two curves on that bottom plot? Yeah, the gray doesn't come out very good. I, I admit that. There is a, a gray one behind that yes. with a slightly yeah. bigger variance. But uh, if you don't see it, you have to believe me. Uh, but uh, so, so part well, of what's the source of this resonant frequency that gets 250 or it's uh, it's the the relay the, the, the sine function in, in the loop the nonlinearity the static nonlinearity together with the dynamics which creates this oscillatory behavior this six volt period type of oscillation and the six slot period is just for the fit this frequency. Okay. So I mean six times two hundred and fifty is is fifty hundred. Yeah, yeah. Okay, another thing. Uh, when we have measurement errors, uh, we can't really I mean if we would like to track Variations in, in the in the SAR target as good as possible. We'd like to have a huge bandwidth of the controller. But on the other hand, that bandwidth of the controller will let in very much noise into to the system as well because that's the same same function. G times SAR target and G times the noise. So if we care about noise, we have to do some loop filtering so that we take care of the noise. Uh, on top of that, we already do some sort of filtering because when we get information in one slot, we only have a few pilot bits to measure on. And typically that's 10% of the entire slot. And uh, this means that we will, we will filter out everything below this frequency we will, we will let through and, and the remainder is, is, uh, is filtered out. If we, if we uh, filter out 25% uh, if we have pilot bits 25% of the slot, we will manage to filter out a smaller part. And if we just take every bit of the slot uh, into consideration when we estimate SIR, we will uh, sort of get this type of, of uh, slot where we filter out essentially everything about here. So the next thing we do after this is to downsample. We only take one sample each slot. And in order to do that, do that without aliasing, we have to filter out everything above the Nyquist frequency. That's here. And as you see here, well, if we take every every uh, sample, every symbol in the slot into consideration, well, then we almost can say that it's okay to downsample. But if we take 25% of the, the bits or 10% of the bits, we can expect quite much aliasing in the measurements. So we can't really rely on good measurements from from when we take that last few pilot bits from the slot into the averaging. So, so that's something also that creates the measurement errors. Uh, okay, just to see the combined effects of some of these things. Uh, oh, mistake. This to say n equal to one. This is from another presentation with another definition of of n. Uh, it should say n equal to 1. Uh, so looking at what kind of, of uh, profile you get from, from when you, when you uh, do power control. Here is fixed step power control, so, so not the full information, the decision feedback case where you only have fixed steps. I will see what kind of error you get. So with the delay and, and the fixed step, you see that we get a certain uh, region here where we get roughly equal probability of, of, of the SR error. Uh, of, this, uh, of the control error. That's of course due to the oscillations. We, we tend to have equal uh, probability of staying within that region. Uh, but if we add measurement errors, we roughly have the Gaussian distribution of the, the control error. Uh, if we add feedback error, that doesn't change too much, really. Uh, if we apply the, the compensation scheme here, we see that we have a much higher tendency of staying close to, to uh, to zero error. So it's not really a Gaussian anymore. It's more compact distribution. But if we add measurement errors, it's close to close to Gaussian again. 
Then some, some, something interesting happens. If we add feedback errors, this is, I think it's as much as 6% here. We see that the compensation scheme actually kicks us in the back. It's, it becomes even worse. Because we suffer from the errors twice. First when they happen, and then we use, use them for compensating. So, so we suffer from them twice. Okay, so, so what kind of control things has been done in, in, uh, outside this on, on uh, local power control uh, design? Well, there's been a lot of things on, on linear design, as, as I just described, where, where various things have been emphasized, where, where this kind of a linear, log linear loop has been in focus. Uh, I did some, some stuff where Smith, the Smith predictor was one thing. Then, one control objective could be to try to minimize the variance between what you would like to have and what you, and, uh, what you have, the, the control error, the difference between SIR and SIR target, CIR, CIR target. Uh, and you can do things around that, and uh, there's a Finnish guy from, from Helsinki who, who, who does this when he tries to, to adapt to, to uh, the dynamics and the error on the fly. Uh, then you can try to, to, to use some, some uh, uh, in a way, predictive schemes, or at least uh, the filtering schemes. Uh, Leon used the comma filter, and essentially used it just to, to, to enter loop filtering, in a way. Uh, there were results in this group, but that was more a way of, of solving the stochastic optimization uh, problem in, in real time, where you, you cannot fully know everything. So comma filter was used to, to estimate uh, things. But essentially, it breaks down to a linear approach. Uh, and there are new uh, and a student try to optimize the filtering when you have measurement error. How, how should you optimize the filtering? And how should you take quantization into account? And of course, I mean, you don't really necessarily have to do linear design in log scale. You can stick with the linear problem where every, every variable is in linear scale and see what happens then. Uh, and also the same group in Helsinki does that, a few papers from them. Uh, of course, you can you can do various predictive things where you try to predict uh, the power gain. So, so as, as you commented on, when you try to, to see in the future what kind of power would be good not now but later on, which is of course even more interesting when you have delays. You can apply nonlinear things to, to design things, and you can try to do some more mathematical oriented things, optimal control. Uh, but essentially, it is this kind of local. Uh, perspective. Uh, okay, so, so of course, would we, if we believe that we are good at, at picking a, a target each and every time, but then this is the perfect objective to try to to uh, track this as good as possible, possibly with minimum variance. But this is not necessarily the case. I mean, we we do have to rely on what the interleaving does for us, or, 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 and what the coding does for us. I mean, maybe the interleaver is not perfectly uh, fit for, for, for a minimum variance type of signal. Uh, typically, a signal that is quite good, and then sometimes, very rarely, but sometimes it's quite good. They're quite bad. That's not a problem for in the interleaver, that's why it's there. So, uh, the objectives of the, of the, of the inner loop control should possibly take into account what kind of, of signal the interleaver really wants to have. So one block error every now and then is good, but but uh, many block errors in a row is bad. Okay, so move to system perspective and then just bring up some, some feasibility issues. Uh, a lot of math in the same slide. Just raise your arm if, if I move too fast. Essentially we just vectorize everything and Instead of using a general I for the interference, we just bring together the signals from all other users. So, so each mobile is I, each base station is J, or I shouldn't say J and I, I should say, uh, or I shouldn't say mobile uh, base station, I should, should say transmitter and the receivers. And that way we keep the problem very general. And we also say that we have M transmitters and M receivers, so we don't have this. Uh, Asymmetric problem with more mobiles than base stations. We have as many receivers as we have transmitters. 
all matrices will be square and so on. Uh, and then it introduced matrices for uh, the gamma target for the, the G matrix divided by, by the diagonal elements. Uh, we also stick with this, this uh, uh, receiver efficiency and we also see that the part that we couldn't utilize up here appears as, as interference down here. Uh, I thought it was a very good model otherwise. Uh, actually when I prepared the presentation I, I got some, some concern whether that's really what, what we would like to have considering a rake receiver. But uh, anyway, it's there uh, on the slide. Uh, <coughs> and for this problem to be feasible and solvable, I mean whether it's, it's possible to find a power vector without considering any limitations, uh, this definition somewhat rewritten and, and uh, reformulated. Uh, it's essentially adopted from Hertner and Schoen, a paper from 2001, uh, where you attempt, uh, try to, to find the limit of how high you can scale the system by, by scaling everybody's CIR targets to see if you scale them by the same amount, when do you hit the roof, when, when do you hit the, the, the limit when you cannot scale it anymore and that, that's defined as a load. And uh, by that definition, the, this feasibility relative load would be between 0 and 1. And in the case where you have no soft, soft and over or anything like that, you can prove that this is what it would be if you know all the matrices. But of course, you don't do that. But anyway, uh, that's what it would be. And that's what we have to fulfill, uh, a load less than 1, if we would like to, if we would believe that power control would do the job for us. So which way is that though? X bar is small, I don't just trying to get it up. So if X bar is small, then gamma, the gamma is over the X bar is equal. So is X bar small, small load or high load? Uh, actually, I uh, 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 might have had a more intuitive definition. They had uh, X, uh, well, uh, 1 over x was, was y, so we would take 1 over x by y. So we had y there, y there, and supremum here instead. And you have, they call it feasibility index, a value greater than 1. So how much could you scale? How much times could you, uh, what, what was factor could you increase the SR target until it, it became too high? Uh, which was possibly more intuitive, but it didn't fit as well into what I, I would like to use it uh, to. So does so it indicate small x bar means like affected that the system is lightly loaded? Right. Like that's what you're yeah, right. Working. Okay. So, so uh, uh, a system where, where L is, is zero, uh, that is a system where when the users doesn't interfere with each other, then this is zero and then you can, I mean, you can increase it as much as you like and you, it will still be feasible. So you don't, you don't interfere with each other. And on the other hand, if it's equal to one, well then it's where, where you're at the maximum limit already. <coughs> okay. Good point. Thanks for helping me clearing that up. Uh, I should also say one thing. All the bars in this picture denote that these are, are quantities in linear scale, not logarithmic scale, as we had previously. Uh, this is the same for the outlink or downlink type of bar, bar control. Yeah, it's the same. So that's why I wanted to stick with this receiver transmitter type of formulation, so I didn't have to, 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 to bring up. Uh, space stations and I mean now all matrices are square and I can discuss the eigenvalues and so on. I could do the same thing but it would just be more complicated notation. Okay, well it was a load measure and it didn't say too much. I mean what it was just the thing with matrices. Uh, I don't know if this says anything more but at least it's different. Uh, so in, in the downlink if we're even more specific here, uh, what we really care about is, is the po power we have in the base station K. And uh, we have some part of that power we have to use for control channels. We have to live with that pilots and, and common pilots on that kind of things. Um, and on the other hand, we have one benefit with these codes we use in, in for example, WCDMA, where, where they are orthogonal when we send them out. Uh, unfortunately, due to the channel, we can't expect the receivers to experience a fully orthogonal situation. So we have a fraction alpha remaining of that interference that we cannot cancel fully. 
Uh, and then if we introduce this weird uh, factor, and this is really the abuse too here, we say that we can define the relation between the interference that comes from the same base station and all the other base stations. And fine. But for on, I will say that, assume that that's the same for all mobiles, and uh, I don't believe that myself, but the expression is easy to handle. And uh, for the sake of charity or something, I, I'll, I'll live with that. Uh, anyway, it becomes like this. I mean, all the base station powers from all other base stations, uh, base stations divided by what I get from my own base station. <coughs> and in that case, I can rewrite uh, CIR to relating to powers from all the base stations and the power intended to the specific mobile. So more towards powers of, of uh, base stations, AK, and the power of the specific mobile. And uh, essentially, I'd like to have this, this as high as possible, even maximum power would be good. So, so there are less, uh, less uncertainties with the interference from other base stations because, well, let's just assume that they are operating at full power all the time. Uh, then I have a rough idea of the interference situation of the mobiles. Excuse me. Yep. Um, can you enlighten what is the uh, origin of this uh, negative contribution in denominators, like minus alpha bar? Oh, yeah, that's not too clear, probably. Uh, okay, so alpha times pk. That's pk is the, the power from my base oh, station. Oh, I see. Okay. So alpha on that remains. You just take away the contribution. But I take, take alpha away, from which is this sort of so say um, so, uh, my power, right? And then. F times the, the same power is, is what I get from all the other base stations. It effectively makes the summation over the contribution exclude intended user. Right, yeah. Uh, and this means also that if I, if I believe that I have maximum power, I more or less have a good control of my interference. So I could say that in the downlink, it's not that much of feasibility. It's more of how do I share the available power between the users rather than saying that okay I have to combat fast fading and all that. In WCDMA we have fast power control even in downlink. I'm not too sure if that's a good move actually. Uh, I mean I don't know more if that really is, is required because to some extent I'm combating the, the same channels from the, the same signal from the same base station and they are traveling through the same channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not through the same channel because they intended to different users which are different locations and that's why the channel is not the same. No, but it, if I'm here, I receive all the signals from all users. But downlink, downlink. downlink. Well, uh, downlink. Well, downlink, yes, but he who sits on another side, so for him the channel will be very yeah, different. But all the, all the users come from the same channel. to you travel yes. to the same channel. That's true. So I have a different situation than I have in the uplink. Where, where all these things come from different uh, sources. And that, that has, has good sides and bad sides, of course. Um, but anyway, well, I mean... So alpha equals zero corresponds to a flat channel. There's no multi-path. Right. And, and the perfect receiver. So that can actually utilize all, all the power so that it can, it can resolve the orthogonality. Uh, this so model I believe more so in. A lot of people use their orthogonality factor just like one minus the factor? I see in all kinds of so Sometimes it's one minus, sometimes it's one divided by. Uh, yeah, uh, this is one of them. Yeah, it's one version of them. Yeah, it's one. I think we do. I don't think this is the one we use. I think we do. He, he, he just takes the PKI, is the total power transmitted by this uh, base station, and times alpha will be just all the power which becomes interfering with the multipass. And then he separately subtracts the contribution, which is actually was this user. So I think... You think it is the same? Yes, I think it's, uh, it's the same and it's self-consistent. But I um, certainly cannot agree with this. That was this. last week. It's hard to remember what. Uh, the statement that power can fast power control forward link doesn't help. So that was just his own comment on the side, right? He did actually write that on the slide. See, but that's why I 25 sucked so much that they don't have the fast 
uh, power control of the forward leg. When the CD Main 2000, for example, on added fast power control, the forward link, uh, the forward link capacity just jumped up across the Um, well, I mean, looking at this expression, this worries me. I mean, the load is directly related to something related to how the receiver behaves. And being the guy trying to control systems that behave well, I'm not really too comfortable with this situation where the mobile's ability to be orthogonal directly affects how I can utilize my resources. Well, I can do some precautions, but this means that I cannot just let go of it and let inner loop power control do the, the job for me. I have to be more careful, actually. Uh, because if the receiver does a bad job for me, I'm in bad shape. Uh, we shouldn't dig into this detail and time's running up, so I'll skip that very quickly. And uh, roughly, I do the same thing. I believe more that, uh, that uh, you can put up uh, the same type of F here, which, which you say this is the relation between inter cell and in intracell interference from other cells and, uh, and own cells because between cells that's more likely that you have the same type of situation than, than with mobiles but anyway we, we can say that we can conclude that we get the same type of uh, expression something divided by one is one minus something and that something down here is associated with load so no equal to one means, means the denominator blows up can I ask something? When you find a, a power control mechanism in a certain standard, right, is it really based on these specific formulas? Formula? I'm afraid it's based on politics, but... Uh, uh, well, I'm saying, for example, if people start using different type of receivers for multi-user detection of the uplink, in particular, equalizers on the downlink for multi-user detection on the uplink, and if this thing is standardized using a factor, interference factor, whatever. No, this, this, is, not, this is not standardized. I mean, this is just, uh, uh, provided that time's running up, uh, I, I put less focus on this, but the idea was to bring up the difference between uplink and downlink, and, uh, and why we had to take some precautions in downlink. That, that, uh, in situations of which it won't appear in the uplink. Uh, but uh, I'll try to bring that up briefly on, on the next slide. Uh, so, not as appearance anymore, but one thing that directly affects uh, my capacity in, in the, in the, if we start from below, in, in the downlink, is something related to, to the mobiles I have, the kind of, of service I have. Uh, and, and that is limited by the availability of power and something very much related to how the receiver behaves. So if, if, I, if I'm very good at handling my interference situation, uh, this will be zero, then I have a better capacity. If I'm always that, that performs badly, I have a worse capacity, and there is nothing I can do about it, really. I, I see the effects, but I can't do anything. Well, I can, but, but uh, at least th that is a, 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 an anomaly that I don't really like. Uh, on the uplink, on the other hand, I do have the same type of, of thing. I have the sum of overall mobiles uh, belonging to that cell, limited by, by, by something. and. Uh, Instead, it's not related to, to the power directly, but rather the, the, the received power in, in, the, in the receiver, uh, in the, the base station receiver. Uh, but with, with the more approximate load uh, estimation method, we can see that instead of, of uh, having the situation that's in the downlink, we, we can share the power. We say, that, okay, this mobile gets this power, this mobile gets this power, and we have this amount of power available. We have a situation where it strongly depends on where the mobile is. So mo if I have many mobiles on, on the cell borders, I have a much higher load than if I have the same amount of mobiles close to the base station. So it's really the intra-interference. Where, where did that show up? Uh, in the 
<laughs> it shows up actually in this formula, and uh, oh, yeah, okay. if you have, you have to tell me if you're worried about time. Uh, so so uh, if you are, just yell at me and I'll wrap up quickly, so I don't, I don't take up your time too much. Well, what this is says is that the, the, the total uh, load of a base station, uh, and this is something that one of my students is involved in, is trying to estimate the uplink load, but this is a simplified version, they just put it up to, to bring up the discussion. It's something related to the service you have. So the better service, the, the higher you load the system. It's also related to the fraction between the gain to the base station you're connected to and the, uh, to, oh, the gain to the base station in question and the gain to the base station you're connected to. So a mobile is connected to another base station. is power controlled by that base station. And the power he is using essentially inverting that channel to that base station. So one over G. Which means that if he has a bad channel, it's quite likely that he will use a high power to disturb me. So one over his channel would sort of increase the interference to me. So it's really that primarily that, that limits the uplink capacity. Luckily that that is, uh, uh, at least in, in uh, WCMA, a much I mean, it's, it's, it's quite far up to, to, to the, before you hit the ceiling in, in that case. What is the power 1C in the ground link? Uh, this is, this ground is the ground power ground. you have to use for the control channels. Uh -huh. So, uh, I try to bring up similar expressions here to, to, to say that, okay, it's very much related to, to um, the receiver capability. Uh, but then uh, a clarification for the uplink is that, that Actually, the load is related to the intercell interference. Uh, okay, uh, actually, I'll skip that. We need to have visibility to have global stability. Of course, we know that. Uh, we, we can prove some, some stability conditions if we have a fixed step stability. A fixed step power controller. Uh, we can do the same thing if we have if we have. Uh, uh, a full information controller in linear scale, and this is to say that okay, in order to be stable when you do when you control the power, you have to have a feasible situation where you can find powers. You have to have a stable local loop, so each and every disturb uh, distributed uh, controller has to be stable, and you have something more. But if you have all that, then you have an overall st stable system. So this means that. You have to have control over your closed loop systems. They cannot be too aggressive, so to say. They have to take it easy. Uh, a high gain in the closed loop system it means that you really try very fast to compensate for, for channel variation. As soon as they appear, they do try to compensate very fast. This is, for example, what you do when you try to do minimum vari variance. As soon as you get the large deviation from the error, you try to quickly as possible compensate for that. And you're quite successful in, in limiting the variations. But this also means that you, you are quite hostile to your neighbor mobiles, neighbor base stations. So a very, very good local loop design could be disastrous on, on the global system level. Uh, some recent uh, ideas have been to try to, to be quicker to convergence, and that, that should also be good in, in the sense that if you're quick at convergence, then you're also uh, fast at mitigating variations. Because as soon as something has changed, then you're, you're sooner compensating for that with the entire network. So instead of discussing convergence and then, uh, in uh, discussing power gain uh, compensating in the local situation, this is to bring it up to the system level and different methods to do that quickly. Uh, and as you see, most of the work is, is from here. Uh, also some things that I, I, I just got to know now, which I haven't picked up yet. Some ideas to relax the requirements so that you can, through a nasty problem formulation, uh, see that you can actually use less power uh, uh, than you have to if you, you require to, to uh, to, uh, fi to, to find your, your CIR targets. 
but I had to read that better to understand all the details. Uh, some things for us to wrap up with. I mean, that, that might, might be fun to watch. This is uh, a typical test case. I mean, it's not the ideal situation, it's not realistic, but it's practical. You have a van, you stuck it with mobiles, uh, can be up to 60 sometimes, uh, and you drive around. You have sometimes you spread out with, with certain uh, hotspots or, or 10 mobiles here, 10 mobiles there. And uh, this is done in, in, in this case, these are, uh, the first one is from, from Ericsson Test Network and, and uh, another one is in, in, uh, in uh, the network being launched. And uh, this is what they do. Uh, yeah, I, was, I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't uh, on that field, sorry, uh, but it must have been quite fun. Uh, they had a, a field tour in Japan when they had 20 mobiles at three locations, so it was also 60 mobiles. And then the police came by and, and, and uh, arrested him because he, he thought that he was selling mobiles to people coming by uh, because he had them on the street. So nothing bad. But this was in, in, in the van, and this is only 20 more bikes, and that was in Stockholm. Uh, so what we did was that we loaded up the system at a good position and just drove out some coverage to see what happened. Okay, so this is the power of a certain mobile. Uh, so first there is this ramp up phase when all the mobiles connect, and then we stand still for a while and then we start driving out the coverage. And here, congestion algorithms and stuff like that will will take precautions. So what do you think your your y-axis is there? So this is the uplink power of, of one specific mobile. Yeah, but is that a DB scale? Uh, that's DB, right. Thank you. Uh, this is actually uh, reproduced from, from log TPC commands from the mobile. So does that mean it's like a 3 DB variation? How you know Hold on. So, are you running any of the algorithms you talked about? Uh, this is the fixed up power control. Oh, fixed up power control. Yeah, so, this is not uh, because you can't do that in, in, uh, in so the uplink. Okay. Hmm. Or actually, for, for the uplink, you, you, I mean, you could. So, how big are those variations in the purple region? Like, are they 3 dB or. Uh, well, 3 dB we'll come back to that when we zoom in there. Uh, so this is the startup phase, and then uh, as we see here, we every now and then have to compensate for for some mobiles coming up, and also we have to compensate. But but uh, we see a slowly increasing power uh, gradually. Um, we actually dropped two calls here just unintentionally, and we had to to put on the vertical of the vertical axis. What is the scale? Uh, it's DB. Yes, but where are the teeth? I mean, yeah, or it's also the identical scale where 50, 100 now on the world. Yeah, well, I, I think even the horizontal scale is too condensed. <coughs> uh, like the very so uh, you want to sort of look at variation, thing. Right? So again, what is your... Um, this is okay. If it's it's like how many times a second do you get a signal? 1,500 times a second, right? 1,500. 1,500 times a second. So the effect is really... The y-axis yeah. could be anything. Like that spike could be... Could be 20 dB if you, you know, have yeah. these. Yeah. Well, we can we can stay with it, something like that. Okay. Uh, uh, this is this from a mobile. I'm, I'm, uh, I could be probably prosecuted or something for showing the mobile performance or whatever. So, so I mean, I probably wouldn't be allowed to show this anyway. But I don't care. Uh, so so it's interesting to see these peaks. This is actually something we, we pointed out at some. I mean, you can't do this. You can't start giving me 10 dB peaks every now and then. And it turned out that they did that every time they reconfigurate, reconfigurated uh, the transmitter. So what's the logic behind this test? You're basically driving all the 60 motor or 20 mobiles with you, right? You're all seeing sort of identical channels, aren't they? More uh, or less? Yeah, more or less. So the what's the point of this uplink test? What is the point of the uplink test? I mean, I don't see sort of anything but about... Uh, in this case, it was, it was two things. To see how conge congestion acted, uh, but this is, I mean, this is pre-pre, this is from last spring. Uh, but it's also to see that mobile behave well, or after too many tests, so of too many disappointing tests, it was to conclude yet again that mobile didn't behave well and be didn't behave standardized. Uh, 
but this is the only only way we uh, we can. So we do you can think this is reflected of a hot spot? This is how sort of it, the the hot spot. Uh, everybody will see the same channel more or less. Everyone's on the train. Yeah, yeah. So something, something. Yeah, I agree. That there are there are definitely some some limitations with with the setup, but uh, no. But maybe I'm saying uh, maybe it's okay if you say if you talk about it in the way he says it, or if it's a hot spot, you say everybody sort of standing around somewhere. Actually, it's a really good test for one reason. Normally, if you have users all over spread all over, the power control commands are uncorrelated; they're independent. Now, for example, the base station, then you can use central limiterium and so on. You just see that the total power fluctuation is actually small. Yeah. And you rarely hit the surge. Now, when you have everybody correlated, suddenly you see the situation that all 60 mobiles, they go up. And then uh, it's interesting to see, like, for yeah. example, the downlink, what the base station will do, because it just doesn't have room for them. But, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I want to see some more... Yeah. I agree that they are correlated, but they are not fully correlated. They are, two, they are 20 centimeters apart, which means that the fast fading is... is uh, fast fading, not but shattering is probably pretty much the same. Yeah, but when you move as, as slowly as we do, and this, in this case we're standing still. And, and this oh, that fading doesn't matter at all. If you're standing still, hey, isn't you're the, is, is there some averaging going on before this power is reported? Yeah. So what's the averaging? It's averaging. <laughs> now, it's... Uh, well, it's not too much averaging, you know, but, but roughly this is uh, this is averaging on on, the, on this stage. This is averaging on on the, on the second level actually. But uh, it wouldn't be too much different. I mean, uh, the averaging is, is more. So, or less so you're different. averaging over a one second window, is what you saying? Yeah, these plots are because, th but that's only to to get nicer plots. So you, you don't see that much difference difference on on. The, I mean, you just have these rapid variations. So. As we showed earlier, we had these six period variations around the slowly varying mean, or slowly but, but uh, at least varying mean. So uh, you didn't see any extra information in that, just more uh, variation. So, so that wouldn't look much different. That was just to make myself handle it. But in, in when I zoom in, I, I don't have that filtering on. Okay, so when we drive out in the forest, we see something. So we still compensate for fading, and then Sometimes we drop when the congestion algorithm goes out to users, so sometimes they are dropped because they, they hit the maximum roof. Uh, and as we see here, we drop a few users, and then we can actually survive a little bit longer. Is that you're saying how you see if it's good or bad? Or how do you say it's, it's bad? Maybe it's really happening with a local environment? Why do you say it's bad? What is bad? When it goes down or up, is it bad or not? Uh, no, you're right. Yeah, I, it could be a local environment. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, <coughs> we also ha had information, I didn't plot that, but when, when you disconnect users, I'm here, so, here, so, here, so, here, so when you disconnect So you have some information where you're saying that calls are being dropped in some place. Yeah, from the system okay. side. Okay, there is right, something else. It's not evident from this. Yeah. 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 Okay, so looking at the part where we're standing still, we see that this kind of variations, and here is no filtering. Uh, that's just TPC commands up and down. And uh, here's the variation that we try to compensate, more or less, when we travel. So this is the one second. And we cannot almost, I shouldn't say, imagine that we try to track some sort of fading, but at least we, it looks like inverse fading. And if we zoom in further on, the recognized picture I used before, this is uh, roughly the six period variations that we saw in the theoretical analysis. Uh, this is a really bad situation with a mobile that is much better now, so that's why I dare to show it. Uh, this is also uh, a situation where we just load up the system to see how it behaves. And this is the, the downlink, the downlink power from the base station, the total, total downlink power from the base station. And uh, at a certain point, we get heavy, heavy, really heavy fluctuations. And uh, the reason behind that is actually that the mobile was very bad at being orthogonal to two signals from the same base station. And uh, I shouldn't say very bad, I should probably say lousy or extremely bad or ridiculously bad. I mean, that, that was... I think that, that's that been a problem uh, for, for us as a system provider, that we are relying so much on, on mobiles being good. And as at this stage, the testing is not fully developed, it's definitely not checked, it's Nothing that is prioritized by mobile vendors, and uh, 
the only thing they care about is to get out to mobile so they can capture as large market share as possible, which they are successful in, I admit that. Uh, and uh, there is some platforms not out yet, and, and uh, consequently a uh, market share of zero. But it would have been good with uh, with, a, with an Ericsson mobile in this case to, to, to sort of have out to market. It shows that um, downlink, oh yeah, what actually I'm um, not to use this, I didn't even think of it. This is actually okay. in dB the difference to maximum power. So this is uh, the maximum power That's in watts. Power, okay. So 3 dB below that is half that. And okay. 6 dB is, is, is Fine. quite precise. So what are these three, uh, how many colors do you have there? Uh, and uh, this is like each color is for, for one base station each. And uh, accidentally, a few mobiles actually came up in software over. That's why we have some power used in the other base station ah, as well. Right. But this is the, the, the serving time to load up. Okay, so that's the base station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a uh, result from a year ago. So, so and you're um, saying it's a bad headset, a bad mobile? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean by bad mobile? Does, it, does it mean that multi pad becomes dominant after yeah. 1,500 seconds? Uh, no, it, it means that the mobile, I mean, theoretically, with the receivers that we're supposed to have in mobiles, we should be able to load up the system much higher. But as we see here, I mean, this is this is 6 dB below. This is five. This is, I mean, this is far up to maximum power. So That's sorry. Right. Let's say that this is a 20 watt base station, for example. This means that we we are we that when we reach 5 watts of that base station, including in control channel power, which is <coughs> quite much of that already, uh, all of a sudden. We cannot really uh, control the system anymore. I mean, it, it start off, starts oscillating heavily. And well, it is because of multi right? But yeah, well, I mean, isn't this attack because yeah. of multi No, it's, the no. Um, it's not multi it's, it's the problem that those mobiles, and uh, I, I can say that now because they, they found all the flaws, <coughs> and, and it doesn't look like this anymore. Uh, but I just wanted to stress the fact that a bad mobile can cost capacity. What is it only yeah, a bad mobile? It's, it's bad at cancelling interference from, so it's from other signals from the no, same. No, 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 but it just relies on the downlink. You well, can just rely on autoagonity of the signals, right? Yes. yes. Well, and so you have multipath, isn't that what it's saying? No, but if you have multipath, if you sit here and you get the signals from a base station, yeah. which goes like this, then all the signals from the same base station will go like this. I mean, so in a sense it's multipath, but in a sense it's not. It's, it's, it's uh, the effect of the multipath that I'm not orthogonal to the other channels anymore. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay, I think I understand what Frederick says. So he says pretty much following: if the interference is saturated by your own signal, so yeah. you neglect the outer, yeah, yeah. other interfe other cell interference, and you lack thermal noise, yeah. just scaling the power up and down doesn't yeah. completely for all the users at the time doesn't change your SNR. So if you have the uniform scale, so it just does it. Yes, up to the is limited because it's using maybe two figures. So if you have a brand one user who is far outside or next to the cell page, and here for some reason this user cannot capture much of the energy and it's but poorly done, it will always send up commands. Yeah, so, so this single user is just no, no, no. So, so it is self interference from multipass. That's it's what it means. Yes, self interference due to multipass because most there's no multipass there. Are most probably you're increasing. Well, I thought you meant was that the field is sort of power compensating for multipass variations, like flat, flat, uh, flat channel variations. But okay, yeah. In essence, the orthogonality factor yeah. changed yeah. in a way that creates. So, what's the value of the orthogonality factor here? But is it high or low? Uh, what is it? Yeah, no, no, the one is the one is the worst. Right. The worst. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. But, but by the way, that might be a reason why Qualcomm is promoting recent application of equalizers for WCDMA rather than a RAID receiver. Well, our control is, is inferior to a rate control in the first place. Yeah, so it's, it's better to have a rate control equalizer and rely as little as possible on the power control. So are you dropping things in order to get off the, the oscillation? Yeah, actually, actually the these two are limits are actually uh, how the system, uh, or that version of the system handles things here. So as soon as you hit this upper limit with the power, you start to throw out uses in the system. Uh, but that's not the reason behind going down all the way that quickly all the time. So what you're saying is if some of the transits are a little better designed to capture so more, of the, more of the, uh, the multi-pack. You need an equalizer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, equalizer. the rumor has, I, I mean, it wasn't confirmed. This was communicated to the mobile vendor. I mean, that, that's, 
the frustrating part. I mean, the mobile vendor says, no, this is, it's a shitty system. And we say, it's a shitty mobile. No, it's a shitty system. Uh, so, so it's really about bringing up these kind of plots and these kind of tests so that we can, we can show. But your rumor has... Equalization is a word. Channel decorrelation. Yeah, no, 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 but the fundamental lesson in multi-user relation is because it's the channel. No, it's because users are independent in the multi-user system. Whereas in the, in the channel, the, your self independent is not independent of you. It depends on what you do. It depends on, you know, they are all dependent signals. They all came from the same place. And if you can... That's, that's the basic difference. And if you can so if you try to do like a DFT type of thing, right? Like, not DFT. If you try to do like Mahesh's type of uh, multi-stage detector, for to do cancellation of uh, equalization, sometimes it can be horrible. Yeah, but so we agree. Because yeah, we, we want to un we want to repair this. Absolutely. Yeah. Equalize if you it, equalize it. Five channel, you would you would just follow the tendency most probably not with those spikes, yeah, but just yeah. uh, uh, floor tendency for this. Back to these spikes. Uh, so I certainly yeah. I, I sort of understand that due to when mobile really sucks, then the curve should go up. I have problem understanding why then it goes down. My impression was He's that you just should people. saturate no, no, the people are so bad that they get dropped. Oh, they're getting dropping people. That's what's going And then they will be admitted back into the system. No, no, maybe you On the scale of like work. less than a second. You see, I, well, I understand why you might saturate power. It's easy. Now, why it goes down and why there maybe is a like... Maybe someone, that will be better. Second, yeah. And then you'll go along seconds. and... And then you go... It'll be a few seconds. He may be, he may be he has to dial up again in the player, or maybe the channels get even worse, right? And now what used to be 60 people became 58, and now 58 people is no good, and then it becomes 56. And, and that game will be just one user survivor. And then it becomes 54, but then maybe the you know, then it's really bad. The rumor has that the, the receiver that had was just one finger receiver. Yeah. Single finger. Uh, uh, single but, finger. Uh, I mean, no, but... He, we, we didn't know. I mean, what chip do you use? I mean, who is making single uh, chips? Nobody, nobody, nobody is anymore. At least this vendor is not. So, so, I mean, this was just pre testing, but so this is not, I mean, this is not the current situation. The current situation is, is actually very good. I mean, things have changed a lot in, in one year. Uh, it, I think it's quite time to see how. how but, but the sad story is that. I said our company wait till the phones are that good and then they release them. But other companies they, they don't do that and, and then they they are dominating the market and, and probably gain from that. And uh, so yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's a weird one. Yeah. So yeah. So this was I mean this was extremely bad. I mean of course no receiver would behave like that when when they are as they should. So so uh, I hope I, I don't have given you the impression of of a situation in here. So, no, this is very interesting. Yeah. So, the, uh, so, the earlier part of your talk, right, have they tried to do anything with those, with some of the controllers that you designed, have they tried to use them somewhere? Uh, I mean, clearly that's not connected to this, what you showed last. The time delay compensation is something that works directly, that then it's easy to implement. I mean, if you have a delay of, of, of one slot, you can only, you can just, when, when you estimate that they are, you, you add just the, the past power control command to it. Just add one to be or take one to be off, and, and you get uh, slightly better performance. But uh, so it's, so that that's part of all the discussion whether that that's that's I mean worth the effort of doing that. But uh, honestly, I'm not sure if it has, has that great impact if you if you pass all the, the, the passages before you have it in the real implementation and, and with all the variations and and the uh, efficiencies you have already, maybe you will end up having something that's zero gain anyway. So, um, I mean, probably this is something that's good as uh, it has to be for for, for a practical system. Uh, after all, we have the how to do power control taking care of, yeah. of most things. And maybe the variations we get every now and then is only something that suits the interleaver anyway. It likes a bad channel every now and then, so it can show that it's good at something. So, so. Uh, but uh, as a theoretical problem, of course, there are so much more things to work on. So, I have a question. Like uh, recently, there is consistent push in the industry. Actually, 
actually away from power control and towards rate control. Which is like, the, the rationale is that in working the channel, if you just take the inverse of the channel and assume it's uh, really distributed, it diverges, so it simply doesn't have a mean. So you actually need, for perfect inversion of a channel, you need infinite power budget because the phase can be as deep as they have it from the low. Um, the rate control, on the other hand, does not suffer from these bad properties of uh, channel inversion. Well, so would it be then better to actually uh, do the rate control instead of the uh, power control in one user system? In sense, that's what would you do in HDR for the CMA 2000 and, and in the, the high speed downlink share channel for, for WCMA sort of evolved three standards to where you have time shared downlinks and, and uh, uh, but, but I mean you, you do suffer from, from uh, from the accuracy of of, uh, of channel state information estimation. So yeah, that, that's all the same. Well, the same is here. That's all the same. Both is true. But I mean, the thing is, I think rate controls are more coarse. Well, it depends, depends on the how you change your constellation. Exactly, it depends on how you change your constellation, right? Well, the power and, and, if you, and if you take away any any practical implementation of uh, say any any higher order modulation. How many rates do you think they, they have? Well, uh, actually, so, I would say in CDMA, no, in CDMA 2000, you have, no, 30 rates, I think. Uh, well, you, well, what, higher well, you have, okay, you have up to 64 modulations, yeah. and then you have a punctured um, code. So ah, okay, have, so they don't, they don't your, your rates are so, so you're doing 1,000 to 2 thirds, 3 quarters, yeah, they and then you start multiplying. You right, can right. Any, any no, no, when you use RCPC, yes, you can get multiplicity. Yeah, so yeah. This actually yeah. the number of rates of granularity is comparable. If you power control, and it's realistic, but you have one dB up and down is also coarse. No, but it is... Is not as close as having like three or four rates. Oh yeah, yeah, three or four yeah, rates. Yeah. Is but once you once you introduce RCPC, you know, we are saying rate compatible uh, yes. function code. Yes. So once you do that, yeah, I think you have sort of. You cover all the rates yeah, from nine tenths to one fifth. Yeah. 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 Can you take a picture of you? Yeah. No, no, it's, it's 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 I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 But uh, I mean, this is all something right. you can do in the downlink, but it would be quite different in the uplink. Then you need uplink pilots, probably, to estimate the quality. Uh, so they have it already? Yeah, the have the have the the HDR the has some sort of that. Well, they don't really have uplink pilots, no? Yes, they oh, are. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, not, not constant, constant power pilots. Well, you have the, 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 the so-called PDM pilots. Okay, some so some the beginning of which frame. Something called HSUPA, and it tries to make the same thing with the offline. Yeah. HDPA yeah. is a scheduled slotted downlink. They try to make a scheduled slotted uplink. On the yeah. Uplink gets synchronized. Yeah. And well, the actually control rather than apart. And even in CDMA 2000, release B, the standard one, we just having this fancy stuff, the reverse link became okay. coherent. So it already had its own dedicated file. But, but th there are so many differences so that uh, one has to consider in the uplink because one thing, not, not a, uh, as opposed to the downlink, one user cannot use up the entire capacity. So uplink capacity is much more open and uncertain as well. But one user cannot have the power for a short time to use up that, that sort of capacity in his slot. That's one thing. The other thing is that it depends so much on where the user is located. The yeah. interest and interference is so much more dependent in the uplink than in the downlink, especially if you're using high powers. Which means that you cannot you cannot uh, distribute those decisions to, to the base stations as you can in the downlink. Well, then usually, therefore, they sort of have two types of channels. The conventional continuous channel as well as the flop and GDM channel for okay, those. Well, I think we can take a here for a moment.